Hello and welcome everyone to another amazing webinar of the Ayurvedic Professionals Association. And um, for those who might be new, the APA, Ayurvedic Professionals Association in the UK is the largest organization that we have here um, in the United Kingdom and we continue to grow every year. And it's really exciting that we have such a massive variety of guest, guest speakers that um, offer their knowledge and wisdom to our community, but not only the Ayurvedic community. We also have plenty of people from outside the Ayurvedic community here for listening to this webinar on healing the thyroid with Ayurveda. And as a health professional, I can only say it's such an important topic to cover. And we are so excited to have Marian, Dr. Marian Teitelbaum with us to do the presentation. But before we go there, I just would like to um, just discuss a couple of housekeeping rules. As with any of our webinars, we kindly ask you to please, leave, to please keep your microphone uh, switched off and also note that this video is being recorded because some of our members and some of people that have been subscribing to the webinar are unable to join live. So the, there will be a recording available afterwards and that can be purchased um, for a small fee. And we very much welcome questions, but please the questions will be um, answered towards the end of the presentation. So we have 45 minutes of presentation and then we go into questions. And please write your questions in the chat box. So without further ado, um, enough talking of me, just a very short bio of Dr. Marian Teitelbaum. Marian Teitelbaum graduated summa cum laude from Palmer College of Chiropractic in 1984. She has studied with several Ayurvedic doctors, including Stuart Rosenberg, MD, and Vaidya Rama Kant Mishra, the recipient of the Prana Ashuti Award in 2013 was given to her, and she lectures and writes exclusively about Ayurvedic treatments for all diseases. And she has a thriving private practice and lives outside of Philadelphia. So very warm welcome to Marianne. Mariana, pass it on to over, over to you, please. Okay, thank you. I'm so excited to be here today and share this knowledge with you. Um, I hope someday when COVID's over that I can come in person and meet everyone in person. Uh, but for now, we'll do everything on Zoom. Um, there were several reasons why I decided to write a book and a thyroid book specifically. The first thing is that when you graduate from Ayurvedic college, it takes many years to gain clinical experience. So that towards the end of your you know, practice, after 20, 30 years being in practice, you've gained that experience and you're getting very good at what you do. Now, if you get the benefit, which I did, of studying with a lineage, <clears throat> a lineage uh, means that father to son passed it on. So I was very fortunate in that Vaidya Ramakant Mishra came to America to make formulations for one of the first Ayurvedic herbal companies and he came from this very long lineage and he sat with me in my practice for the better part of 20 years. So when you come from a lineage, you're starting out your practice after college. <clears throat> you have no experience, but you sit with your, he sat with his father for seven years and your the father gives all his clinical knowledge so that you very early on become very good at what you do. And his father got it from his father from his father for 5,000 years. So I was the beneficiary of this knowledge and I feel compelled to pass it on because my teacher's lineage stopped when he came to the United States. In other words, his children didn't carry it on. Plus I had the advantage of learning very detailed information on how to treat every disease. Um, what I have seen with Ayurvedic literature, the books are all wonderful. I have them all here, I've read them all. They're all very general and I feel a great need for practitioners and the layperson alike to understand how to treat specific diseases. 
So that's very much lacking. And I started with the thyroid gland because we're seeing that the most. In my practice, I treat all diseases every day, but I see thyroid constantly at such epidemic levels. And one final thing is that there are some books that are written from practitioners in India, but they're not as accessible to us here in the West when you hear the language straight from the Vedic text. So I feel like I'm an intermediary between that ancient knowledge and modern science. And everything those ancient doctors said has been proven in modern science. So if you look in my book, you'll see a hundred pages of research. So um, let's continue on. We're gonna go quickly through these concepts. Oops, it looks like um, it won't let me move on to the next. Let me see, wait, let's try it again. This one. Okay, let's see, it won't let me go to the next screen. Marin, I think try either going to the right or down with the keys. Would that do the trick? Uh, before, when I was going down, it was moving. It's, it's not going anywhere now. Uh, let's see. Is there anything, Carolina, you can help us? Could you try side to side, perhaps? The okay, there it goes. So here it says, what is Ayurveda? We'll quickly go through this uh, because most of you know, it's a 5,000 year old tradition of holistic medicine from India and uh, uses herbs, food and spices for healing. Ayurveda is different than others in that they discuss nine stages of a disease process. You don't get a disease overnight, but instead you progress from the first two stages where things are going out of balance. There's no symptoms of anything yet to the third and fourth stage where you might have symptoms, but there's no disease. Many people we see with thyroid problems have lots of thyroid symptoms. They get their blood work done. They say everything looks good. That's because they're in the third and fourth stage. In the fifth and sixth stage, now you can start diagnosing it with blood work or CAT scans. And then from there, it deteriorates. So, um, so it's great because this tradition looks at the early stages and jumps in and reverses those. So you don't make your way towards a disease. Whereas modern medicine is doing the opposite. They let you progress through the stages. And once you're there, they've learned to suppress the symptoms of the disease, which isn't correct. Um, the, it, in the book, I'll talk about the seven tissues, which I'm sure you all know. Um, there's Rasa, Rakta, Mamsa, Meda, Asti, Maja, Shukra. We'll talk about those here in the PowerPoint. But in my book, I'll go into great detail. These are the seven tissues of the body. We'll talk about what Vata, Pitta, Kapha means. Uh, and in that Vata, Pitta, Kapha, they have these subsections called subversions, which you could feel in the pulse. In the book, I lay out exactly what it is we feel in the pulse. And also we'll talk now about toxins, what ojas is, and how we balance the body, mind, and emotions. The number one thing before any prescription is written in Ayurveda is to look at what's called the hetu, the underlying etiology. And every day in my practice, people tell me they have this or that symptom or this or that disease, but no one not even the doctors are asking what might have caused it. And that's where we're going wrong with medicine. Now, thyroid problems are epidemic levels. Here are some of the figures. You can see Hashimoto's affects 14 million people uh, in the world. It's the most common autoimmune disease. In America, we have you know, 20 million people with thyroid problems. Most of them are unaware that they have that because again, their blood work shown that everything looks good, even though their hair is falling, they've had miscarriages, they're fatigued, and they have all the thyroid symptoms. Now, there's two types of patients you encounter. First, there are people who have the thyroid symptoms, like I just mentioned, but their blood work is normal. Then you see other people, they have thyroid symptoms, their blood work is showing they have a problem, and they're put on the thyroid hormone, but they still have the same exact symptoms that's because they're not getting to the root of the problem. So the allopathic, the regular modern medical uh, associations will put you on synthetic or natural hormones. Sometimes people think they'll get better if they take the natural version of the hormone. That's not necessarily the case. 
you're not going to get better until you fix the underlying reason that the thyroid's weak. So sometimes people will jump back and forth between the synthetic levothyroxine, or then they'll try maybe the nature thyroid, the more natural from the pig and cow thyroid glands, and they're still not feeling well. Now here in the Western world, in the UK, as well as here in America, we have alternative doctors, functional medicine doctors, naturopaths who have wonderful training. They do wonderful blood work, very detailed, but sometimes they get caught up using all kinds of synthetic remedies themselves, which we're trying to avoid. We'll talk about that in a minute. So they would recommend these types of things, L-tyrosine iodine, vitamin D3, ashwagandha. So some herbs are mixed in there, some synthetic nutraceuticals, um, but still, we have to get to the root of the problem and we want to use more natural remedies. So here it tells the, the, the Ayurvedic approach, always first find the underlying cause. And with every disease you see, especially the thyroid gland, the underlying cause is different in each person. First, find the cause, support the thyroid gland using herbs and spices, and you have to teach the patient always how to detox, how to have a good daily routine and, um, and teach them how to take the herbs for their problems, those three things. Now the thyroid hormone is produced first, um, a signal is sent. When the hormone gets too low, the hypothalamus in the brain releases thyroid, thyrotropin releasing hormone, which tells the pituitary to release its hormone thyroid stimulating hormone, that's TSH, and it tells the thyroid gland to release its hormones. So there's this feedback loop that's occurring. So the thyroid hormones uh, in the body increase your metabolism, they help your brain development, they are involved in the circadian rhythms that help us sleep. I see many people that can't sleep because the thyroid's weak. I see many children that aren't growing, because the thyroid's weak, or maybe their brain's not developing 100%. Many people I see are gaining weight even though nothing has changed in their diet. Many people I see are depressed and they're put on antidepressants, but the root of it is the thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland is unique in that it's the only gland whose hormones affect every cell in the body. But then in reverse, anything that goes wrong in the body can weaken the thyroid which is something we want to remember uh, because anything can cause thyroid weakness, see? So until you figure out what those things are, the thyroid will always be faltering. So symptoms of low thyroid function, brain fog, thinning hair, your hair's falling, you might have a goiter, your heart might beat irregularly, constipation, irregular menstrual cycles. I see many young girls who they're skipping their periods, they might get two or three periods in a year. The answer here in the Western world is put them on the birth control pill, which is, um, it's like a Band-Aid. It, it makes it look like you have a regular period, but you're not really fixing anything. You're just creating breakthrough bleeding because you're not taking the pill that week. Meanwhile, the pill is very nasty and can cause lots of side effects. All the women that I see who've had miscarriages, when they test them, they say, everything looks good. They don't know why they had the miscarriage, but when I test them, I could see that the thyroid's weak because we could feel in the pulse when it's weak many years before it will show up on the blood work. Same thing, depression, weight gain, dry skin, fatigue. Sometimes the thyroid is hyper where your heart will beat quickly, uh, you lose your appetite or maybe have an increased appetite. You're losing weight so rapidly. You're very hyper and nervous, have a hard time falling asleep. Your period becomes very short. Your eyes can protrude or become very puffy. Uh, you could have tremors. Now the thyroid gland itself makes four hormones. They're called T4, T3, T2, T1. It's very easy to understand. That's why I thought I can write a book about this. Even the lay person can understand this. The T stands for tyrosine. And the number next to it tells you the amount of iodine molecules attached to the tyrosine. So here you have tyrosine uh, with four attached, that would be T4, four iodine attached. So 80% of the thyroid hormones are T4, 15% are T3. The other two 
uh, are T2 and T1 are very minimal, about 5%. So the T4 circulates around the body until the thyroid hormone is needed. When it's needed, it converts into T3 and it's taken up into the cell. So the, the hormone can't actually help you until it gets inside the cell. So we're going to remember that because there's many reasons why it might not gain access into the cell. Now, this is very important. I start out my thyroid book talking about the liver and the friendly bacteria in the gut. And that's because that's how the body works. Any system that we have, any symptom, any problem, any disease you can think of, the cause of that disease is usually many, it's not one. And it's far removed from where the problem is. So we have to stop that knee jerk reflex to constantly say, oh, the thyroid is weak. Let's look at the thyroid and take thyroid hormone. The cause is coming from outside the thyroid. So here, 80% of that, conversion of T4 to T3, so it gets into the cell, occurs in the liver. And 20% occurs with the friendly bacteria in the gut. So there's lots of reasons why our liver is compromised in this day and age. A newborn baby, as soon as it's born, already has over 200 chemicals that it got from the mother's blood. And the baby has that in the umbilical cord blood. Our liver is so compromised, we just don't realize it with air pollution environmental toxins, bad oils. Every time we eat a vegetable oil, which we all grew up on here in the States, we grew up on corn oil. In India, they're eating sunflower oil and canola oil. Uh, when you heat those oils, they form a poison. Everything you swallow, the liver has to process. So every new patient, the very first thing I have to do is fix the liver. You have to clean it, you have to cool it as it got overheated from all these chemicals going through it. And you have to regenerate the liver cells. These herbs I talk about specifically in my book, what herb cools the liver? What herb regenerates the liver cells? I've never seen another book talk about that. Uh, so again, the liver is toxic in this day and age. It's overheated, much like rain, which is alkaline water. When it goes through air pollution, it becomes acid rain. Our liver is holding on to so many toxins between the pharmaceuticals that we overuse and the bad food that we overeat. So it's overheated from those acid chemicals, not to mention if it's damaged from bad oils, uh, bad al you know, alcohol and nutraceuticals, even synthetic vitamins can hurt the liver. Every new patient I see has depletion of the bowel flora. These are the friendly bacteria that reside in the gut because there's so many medications that are listed here that would wipe them out, antibiotics, birth control pills, immunizations, steroids, not to mention that, but in the book, I talk about the fact that the probiotic cultures, I looked at them under a microscope. That the cultures were dead in just about every company. And um, same with the yogurt, even the good yogurts. The book talks about why that is. And it shows you a way out of it. it, shows you the best probiotic to take. Now, there's also nutrients that are required for the conversion of T4 to T3, which I list here. <clears throat> but there's a difference between natural and synthetic vitamins. And the difference is the natural contain prana. So in my book, I have a good explanation on what prana is. It's that vibration from the sun and the moon hitting the food as it grows out in the fields, hitting the herbs, gets absorbed in the food and the herbs. That vibration gets into us when we take that remedy and it gives intelligence to our cells, see? So if the remedy coming in say B complex or selenium or L tyrosine is synthetically made in a lab, which they mostly are, when it comes in, it's toxic to the liver and it's gonna have side effects, just like the pharmaceuticals that we're trying to get away from. So that's one thing. So here it talks about that. The, these are considered dumb or dead. They're just toxic to the liver and kidneys. They sound good in theory, uh, that, you know, if a little bit in food is good, then maybe if we make them in a high dose in a lab, then that must be better. And that's how pharmaceuticals are made. And again, that's what we're trying to get away from. So, in fact, if you took antioxidants like vitamin C and E synthetically made, they actually create free radicals. See, here in Ayurveda, we use amla berry, chivan prash. These were not isolating and synthetically making it in the lab. And these quench the free radicals, see the difference? So, 
So in Ayurveda, we always want to use for healing anything made in nature that has the prana, herbs, food, and spices. Now here in the book, I talk in detail about what vada, pitta, and kapha are so that the patients can understand. What we usually see is that the thyroid patients have a lot of vada disturbance. That means that that element in nature of quickness, dryness, uh, roughness, coldness, it's, it's too much because maybe they rush through the day or they don't have a regular routine. So here it tells you how to balance it. You need the opposite. So if vada in nature is cold, then you want warm homemade cooked food, not cold smoothies for breakfast, not salads for lunch, warm homemade cooked food. If vada is light, we want some unctuousness uh, and it's dry. We want some good fats in the diet. The book goes through all the good fats, the ghee, the cultured ghee, the difference, the recipes to make both. As I was sitting with my teacher for those 20 years, I would write up the protocols for the patients and almost every day, my teacher was telling someone that the, the main reason they had their problem was because they were rushing all day. They were in a fight or flight mode, we call it in the West, but in Ayurveda, you know, they say too much vada. So you want to go to bed early, stay warm, try to get out in nature and absorb that, that vibration of nature, learn how to rub the body with oil. The book has a, um, a whole section on oil massages. You want the body more unctuous, not so dry. Anyone with thyroid problems would tell you they feel dry, their hair is dry, everything's dry. So these are some of the things you want to avoid. Uh, a lot of the patients that I see here in America anyway, are following uh, a vegan diet, which is the most vada aggravating diet of all next to say a raw foods diet, um, because it's very vada aggravating. If you have fruits, vegetables, grains, and lentils, while they might be healthy, there's no animal protein. And the ancient doctors of India in their textbook said, you need something from an animal at every meal. So many people who are vegetarian are misunderstanding what that means. They're thinking it means that they're not having any animal protein, but it means that you're not killing the animal to get the animal protein. So if you think about it, the whole body is made of animal protein from the bones with their collagen, the ligaments, tendons, muscles, cartilage, the hormones that keep us young, estrogen, the adrenal hormones, they're made of cholesterol. Cholesterol comes from an animal, see? Uh, so the thyroid hormone is made from animal protein. So many people we see, they're just not eating enough raw materials to make the thyroid hormone, see? So you have to consider all these things. Um, there's other things here that you can read over. This I always thought was interesting. You can read about it more in the book. I don't wanna to spend too much time because this PowerPoint contains a lot of information, but sometimes um, what happens is the thyroid hormone, it's bound to a protein. It's almost like you're making the hormone and it's driving around in a vehicle, like a little car. And when you need that hormone, it has to get out of the car so it can have its effect and it becomes what's called a free hormone. Uh, especially if you take say birth control pills, when the thyroid hormone's called for, it can't get out of the car <laughs> like that. So you can learn a little bit about that and what affects that, the liver malfunction, which everyone has that, birth control pills, all the girls in the States here are taking those, hormone replacement therapy, steroids, malnutrition, which everyone I see, I would consider if they're on a vegan diet, kind of somewhat malnourished. There's other causes of thyroid problems, toxins, inflammation, and again, malnutrition. So let's look at that. The book will describe four types of toxins. One thing that I loved about the book is that all the other books I have read always talked about ama. So we all know that ama comes from partially digesting the food. Uh, it can't absorb in the cells. It remains stuck in the intestinal tract and it sits outside the cell, clogs the channel. And uh, so, but no one talks about ama visha what happens when the ama rots and becomes acidic and can pave the way for autoimmune diseases and cancer. Because with those two, autoimmune and cancer, the inside of the cell is acid. So if you're forming ama visha from the food 
uh, then that can pave the way for like Hashimoto's uh, or cancer. Gar visha are the chemicals from the outside world. The word visha means poison, see, and that's also a very hot toxin. And the last one is electromagnetic toxins. Um, the book will talk about exactly what the four types of toxins are and what to do for each type of toxin. It's a little different for each type because if you have ama, you have to burn that out of the channel. But if you have ama visha and gar visha, the acidic toxins, you have to flush them out with cooling therapies. But what I could see with all the Ayurvedic books written, they're burning ama all the time and they're not aware of ama visha and gar visha. And it's because they didn't have too much garvisha in ancient times. These are chemicals from outside the body, air pollution, pesticides, lots of pharmaceuticals, synthetic vitamins. So they didn't really write about it. So here for the first time, we're talking about upgrading Ayurveda for this modern age, even though we're adhering strictly to those ancient texts. You can get inflammation from gut infections. Every patient I've seen over the last 35 years presents with an a gut infection. It's called Candida albicans yeast. It comes when you lose the friendly bacteria in the gut. There's always a little bit of yeast in our gut, but our friendly bacteria keeps it in check. So if we ever took an antibiotic or a birth control pill or a steroid and you lose those friendly bacteria, that little bit of yeast can multiply as much as it wants now because it's left unchecked and creates lots of problems. So almost I would say 99.9% .9 of the new patients I see do have an overgrowth of yeast. It's easy to fix if you know how to do it. The book will talk about that. Also overheating in the liver from Amavisha and Garvisha. I don't think I have felt a pulse in my last 35 years in practice where the liver was happy and nice and cool. It's always overheated. The book talks a lot about that. malnutrition. Sometimes your digestion can be weak. Um, and then the food doesn't burn and absorb, uh, or the diet is too malnourishing. Everyone I see nowadays, they say, well, I don't have grains. Oh yeah, but I don't have dairy. Uh, and also I don't have any fat. And we're eliminating too many food groups. So the diet's getting malnourishing and it's creating what's called low ogis, which you could feel in the pulse. So here, the book has a nice section on what ogis is. It's formed once you swallow the food, and digest it, it goes into the bloodstream. It spends three to five days in that first tissue called the blood plasma. Uh, then it goes to the next tissue, spends three to five days there, the blood, then the muscle, then the fat, the bone, the bone marrow, the reproductive fluids. The food that you eat today won't nourish all seven till about a month from now. The only exception to that is milk. And I'm saying that for a reason because I don't know what's going on there in the UK, but one thing I can tell you is going on here is that the dairy, the entire dairy industry is going out of business because everyone is calling milk a poison. And it's not true. It's true that the way we feed the animals, take care of them, the way we take the milk, and if our own digestion is weak, it might turn the milk into amavisha immediately because of our digestive problems that we have. But what I said in the book is if you get good milk that's non-homogenized, the cows are eating grass, you boil it and you take it correctly, it immediately goes through the seven tissues. It's the most nourishing food. It's the most vata pacifying food. It make, that's why you feel very calm when you have warm milk. And it makes ogis immediately. So this is important to know. This is why babies can live off of milk for that first year, but they couldn't live off any other food or any other type of milk. They couldn't live off almond milk or macadamia nut milk, see? So what we do with the patients, we fix their digestion, introduce the good milk, and then people who felt they couldn't tolerate milk were able to tolerate it again. The book talks a lot about that, so we're not gonna spend too much time there. Ogis gives you great strength, stamina, but too much stress can deplete it or if you're malnourished, avoiding too many food groups because maybe you have too many food sensitivities too, which by the way, can be fixed. If you exercise too much, you're exercising you know, two at three hours a day, too much sexual activity, your menstrual cycles are too heavy because your thyroid's weak or you're dehydrated, this can deplete your ogis, you feel weak all the time. 
Now, this is something that I discovered on my own. And I have a whole chapter on the thyroid's effects on the gallbladder. And what I found was very interesting. When the thyroid's weak, the gallbladder is automatically weak. So you'll see many people will tell you, oh yeah, I have Hashimoto's, oh, I have gallstones. Oh, I have hypothyroid, I had my gallbladder removed. So you're always seeing that. And I could feel it in their pulse too. Um, and I saw it so much, I started to try to find out why that would be because again, the Ayurvedic literature doesn't talk in these terms. And what I found is that the acupuncture meridian for the thyroid gland, it dumps, it supplies, dumps into the gallbladder meridian. So if the first one is weak, the second one is weak. Now, there's a whole host of things that happen here when the gallbladder doesn't empty the bile well. We'll quickly go through them, but I thought that this was one of the most important chapters in the book because I haven't seen anyone write about this. And it's a very important thing. We're overlooking the effect of the gallbladder on our health. So first of all, it creates acid reflux. Let's spend a minute talking about that. When you swallow the food, it goes into the stomach first. There's all this acid churning the food in the stomach until it becomes a liquid acid. That acid next squirts into the duodenum. The duodenum is a transition area. It's, it's the very beginning of the small intestines. And it's the beginning of the long journey the food's now gonna make through the small intestines, the large intestines, then it comes out the other end. But the duodenum is a transition area too. So once these acids enter the duodenum, a signal is sent to the gallbladder to release the bile. And the bile does two things. It moves the food downward. It creates what's called peristalsis, little muscular contractions in the bowel. So the food moves downward and it alkalinizes the food as it comes out of the stomach, see, because you don't want acids burning up your digestive tract. So if the bile doesn't flow because your thyroid's weak, the acids move up. They call it acid reflux or GERD. Many people have this. And the mistake modern medicine makes, they give medicines to take away the acid called proton pump inhibitors or PPIs. So now you have no acid and no bile. That's why it's not helping that much. We need to get to the root of the problem, which is to get the bile to flow. In the book, it tells all different ways to do that. The other thing is the bile has two detergents in it that emulsify the fats that we eat and break down these big fat globules in our food into very small ones so we can absorb them. So if the bile's not flowing, the cholesterol will go high. And the mistake the doctors make again is they put you on these statin drugs, which have lots of side effects, <clears throat> one of which is it damages the liver, but it's still not getting to the root of the problem. We wanna keep our bile flowing. See, also this is, I, I see all these, these problems every day in all of our patients and no one's addressing the root causes. The bile is where the liver dumps estrogen every day into the bile. It breaks it down, dumps it, because estrogen's made out of cholesterol and estrogen makes things grow. So it's good to get rid of that. We don't want too much estrogen hanging around and building up the endometrium lining and creating a heavy menstrual flow, or it could cause cysts on the breast or the ovaries, fibroid tumors in the uterus, see? So if the bile's not flowing, the estrogen sits there and it reabsorbs and you wind up with a situation of high estrogen, low progesterone. If your digestive juices um, are acidic, then the digestive juices next become the blood. And if the blood's acidic, the bones have to give up their calcium to keep the blood alkaline. So you could get osteoporosis. And the final thing is that the bile takes out, like the liver breaks down all the fat soluble toxins, dumps it in the bile, and the bile gets rid of them. So if the bile's not flung, the toxins keep reabsorbing. So that's why all of our patients who see me, the first thing they tell me is they want to cleanse, they feel very toxic, but you can't do that until you fix the gallbladder. Otherwise you'll cleanse, you'll release the toxins and they reabsorb. You'll cleanse, they release the toxins, they reabsorb. So bile flow is something very interesting and it also gives you the urge to move your bowel. So people who are constipated, they're taking herbal laxatives like senna, cascara, sagrada. We don't wanna do that. We wanna fix the bile flow because it gives you that urge to empty out. 
lot of people are taking magnesium, which is a laxative. But again, it's not getting to the root of the problem. Let's see, uh, I have a whole chapter on Hashimoto's um, where what I say is that it's the most common autoimmune disease. It wasn't very common when I was growing up because we didn't have 70 immunizations that we gave children. We didn't take antibiotics every time we were sick. And we didn't really have that many birth control pills back then. So all these types of medicine are upsetting our immune system. So what happens is the immune system is attacking the thyroid. So Hashimoto's, I try to tell the patients who come in with this problem that it's not a problem with the thyroid as much as the immune system. And what you have to do is fix the immune system so it stops attacking the thyroid. But mainstream medicine gives the thyroid hormone, which just weakens the thyroid further. Because once you take that medicine, the thyroid is no longer called upon to make its hormones. So it gets very weak and can kind of go into hibernation or even maybe disintegrate if you're on it too long. So that's not the answer. See, so what's happening, the immune system's attacking the thyroid, the hormones go low. So see the mistake they're making, they give the hormones when we should start at square one and see what's affecting the immune system. Even with alternative medicine, even in Ayurveda, there's a tendency to wanna to give the herbs that we use for the thyroid, ashwagandha, shilajit, uh, alternative medicine, give l tyrosine, but we have to shift our focus more to the immune system, see. So what is the immune system? Well, here we go again. It's the friendly bacteria in the gut, the liver, but also the bone marrow. Now I've started to see less 30 years ago, people weren't talking about the friendly bacteria in the gut, but I have to admit people are understanding that this could be at the basis of a lot of diseases that we're seeing. They call it the gut microbiome nowadays. <clears throat> so that's getting a lot of publicity, but I haven't seen anyone write about the liver, which is part of the immune system and even more so the bone marrow. So this will be the first time I think in a book they're gonna show you that with the liver, what we're finding is that it's overheated and pushing the immune system to overreact. Now, we talked earlier about what depletes the friendly bacteria, all those medications. Too many, what heats up the liver, too many toxins from too many synthetic vitamins, bad food, pharmaceuticals. And toxins enter the bone marrow. Every time you step outside and you breathe in the air pollution, those chemicals go immediately into the bone marrow. Here in the States, we have this big thing. Everyone gets flu shots every year. These are some of my sickest patients. People have had 20, 30, 40 flu shots. The chemicals in the flu shot go immediately into the bone marrow. I know it's a bad time to talk about vaccines because the whole world's thinking of it. And I'm not talking about the COVID vaccine. We could keep that separate. But I would say that we're giving our children too many immunizations, some of them not necessary, like for some of the mild childhood diseases, like maybe chickenpox is mild and mumps, rubella. But it's, it's just too many pharmaceuticals that we're taking. And many of them make their way into the bone marrow. Many pharmaceuticals make their way into the bone marrow. Heavy metals from air pollution, uh, from mercury amalgams in the mouth uh, go into the bone marrow. Pesticides can also go in the bone marrow. So in the book, I talk about how to clean the bone marrow, how to clean the liver and that. So, and how to regrow the friendly bacteria. Now, if you have Hashimoto's, that means your liver is very hot. The hotter it gets from all these chemicals, it's gonna overheat. So you don't want to swallow anything that would heat the liver more. Like milk thistle is an herb for the liver. It's too heating. When I have a patient who's on that, I take them off it immediately. People are taking turmeric. They heard that it was good for you. It's good if you cook it into ghee or milk where it's cooling it down and the fat delivers it in the cells. But to take a capsule of it, it's gonna burn up the liver. There's a big cleanse that happens here in the States. It's a maple syrup cayenne pepper cleanse. It's called a master cleanse because it's burning ama out of the channels. But see, most people have the hot, acidic ama vicious and gar vicious. Fasting, intermittent fasting is all the rage here in the United States, but it heats the liver. The liver has five digestive fires. It's looking for food. We don't recommend that. All the cleanses we do, we're having the patients eat throughout the day. 
uh, and they eat detoxifying foods. The book talks about that. Ashwagandha and shilajit, these are the two herbs for the thyroid gland, they're heating. So in the book, I show you how we administer those through the skin. Um, <clears throat> so. so here it tells you how to fix Hashimoto's, fix the gut, the liver, the bone marrow, <clears throat> support the thyroid gland. We give a lot of the herbs through the skin. It's a transdermal application. When Vajra Misha, my teacher first came here, he laid out all the Ayurvedic herbs. He was very proud. He said, I'm bringing these herbs from India. I'm gonna show you how to use them. And he started taking pulses of everyone and he turned to me and I'll never forget that day. He said to me, I don't know what we're going to do. He said, I have all these herbs, but people here in the West, you know, it's my first time here in the West and I'm feeling their pulse. He said, the liver's too hot and angry. They, they can't tolerate these. We can't put people in ashwagandha. It's such a hot herb. We can't put people on shilajit. The liver's already outrageously hot. And he said to me, I don't know what I'm going to do. So it took him about four years. He finally figured it out, but he did two things. He figured out how to just take the intelligence of that herb and get rid of the crude herb because it has so many side effects. And it's just the vibration of that herb, kind of like the Bach flower remedies. And so we have about 150, 200 herbs we give in that way, little drops that we put in water and the water takes on that vibration. It immediately goes into the cellular system, into the gaps in between the cells and has its effect without having to heat the liver more. He also developed transdermal application of the herbs where you rub the herb on the skin, it goes directly into the blood, bypasses the liver. And then we also have, you know, for everyone, balanced diet, early bedtime, and how to cleanse. Now, it is possible to get off thyroid hormones if you haven't been on them too long. Our goal in truth isn't so much, my goal in writing the book wasn't to tell people you must get off your thyroid hormone, but it was more like the thyroid is weak. It's a very delicate little gland and anything that's off in the body, the liver, the gut, the bone marrow, if there's too much fluoride, here in the States, we have fluoride in the drinking water like you do. That's responsible for a huge epidemic of thyroid problems because fluoride is a poison to the thyroid. It shuts it down. So the book mentions all these things that are weakening it. If you could fix those things, you would be amazed. The thyroid perks right back up, especially if you support it with the herbs, good diet, early bedtime, getting in the sunshine, see? The other thing is that Unlike the way we treat diseases here in the West, where we have the same medicine for every person, every patient that I see who has thyroid problems, the underlying causes are different in each one. In this group over here, they've had too much fluoride. In this one over here, the mercury from their flu shots is torturing the thyroid. But in this one over here, they're a vegan. They never get flu shots or have any mercury or fluoride water, but the thyroid can't work because the diet's too depleted, see? So that's the trick. Identify what's causing it in your case. Again, it's usually a few things, not one. Address those issues and then the thyroid perks up. So, so that was all I wanted to say. Um, I'm sure I've spawned a lot of questions. So at this point I could take questions from you. Wow, thank you so much, Marianne. This was amazing, so fluid and so interesting and really just kept us all on our toes, just really uh, enjoyed it very much just from my perspective and I guess our audience really liked it looking at the the chat box it has really triggered quite a lot of questions and interesting comments so may I ask uh, Colette maybe to ask the first question I guess what we will do is we alternate the questions between Colette and Sue and um, we have set about 45 minutes time aside for questions and answers Okay. So I hand over to Colette now, please. Okay. Um, so I've got a question from Susan Taylor. She was asking, if you don't want to eat animal meat, what is a good substitute? Milk and milk products, good quality milk. The book shows you what the best milk is and uh, you know how to make yogurt, there's recipes for that, or paneer, there's recipes for that. But it comes from an animal, that's what I meant. You can be vegetarian, but you must have the milk and the milk products. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Natalie Taylor, 
It says, in your opinion, if one has been on synthetic medication for a few years, um, is it possible to correct the changes to lifestyle, can reduce and then come off completely in due Every, course? Everybody's different, but a few years isn't really that long. Um, I've had people who are on, on thyroid medicine longer than that get off their medicine. So it's always worth to try, but first, don't start out by trying to get off the medicine. First, try to identify what's weakening the thyroid, support it, fix those reasons, and as you feel better, just very slowly wean off it and keep getting your blood work done to make sure it's working, so. Great, we've got a question from Ian Wood. Um, what can be the possible imbalance behind high TSH and borderline T4? The THS can be on to 20 when normal, when normal would be about 0 0.4. So, you know, if you look on my website, if you read the book, put it that way, um, what I hope to do in the book is to break that habit of trying to isolate and just looking at TSH. Of course, when the TSH is that high, it's letting you know your thyroid's not working. So for all the reasons I just mentioned here, you have to see, how am I eating? Is my vada disturbed? Do I have too much mercury? Do I, am I drinking fluoridated water? Uh, you know, am I avoiding too much animal protein? All these things you have to consider and then support the thyroid and then you watch the TSH go down. Don't get involved with the numbers. Don't get involved with what they're telling you you have, whether it's Hashimoto's. These are all just names and numbers but the, the idea is that your thyroid, something's bothering your thyroid and you have to identify it so the thyroid's not bothered anymore. Great, thanks. Okay, we've got one here from Adriana and she says that she's heard that in the US all milk contains fish oil by law as a requirement for the vitamin levels, so it's not vegetarian. I've got no idea on that. Maybe it's the same here. That I don't know about. My teacher from India, who I spent those 20 years with, was a very strict vegetarian. Um, it could be that 90% of the dairies in America, the cows aren't being treated correctly. and They interfere in that way with the milk. They're giving them grains instead of grass. But we use very few local dairies. For instance, where I get my milk is from an Amish farmer. He only has a few cows, he milks them and he sends me the milk. So, so we're making sure that we're sending our patients to dairies that aren't doing that, you know? So, and in the book, I list some of the dairies too. I'm sure you have good dairies there. You just have to seek them out. Great, thanks. We've got a question from Umeda. She's asking, how can one improve good gut bacteria? That's what the book describes. So there's different ways. Some people, we teach them in the book how to make their own yogurt. Uh, Dr. Mishra and I looked at different yogurt starter cultures, and the ancient text said that the yogurt has to taste alkaline. If it's acidic, the acids will kill the friendly bacteria in the yogurt. So we finally found one. I list the name of that yogurt starter in the book. But many people I see are sensitive and allergic to milk. So what we have to do is spend many months fixing the reason why, again, it's their liver, it's overheated. So when the milk comes in, it immediately turns the milk into amavisha. See, everything you swallow, the liver has to process. So it has to intelligently process it and send it on its way. But when the liver's hot and angry and it's in a bad mood, when the food comes in, instead of processing it correctly, it has a temper tantrum on the food meaning that it oxidizes the food or it turns it into this hot amavisha immediately. It's not supposed to do that. So then you feel symptoms and you say, oh, I, you know, I'm allergic to milk and I have to avoid it. And I got this blood work and it shows me I'm allergic to these foods. So I'm avoiding those, which you can do. But the real issue is let's fix the gut and the liver. Because if they're not working right, the food won't break down and absorb in the cells. It remains in the gut. First it forms ama, then it rots and ferments and forms amavisha, this acidic toxin, see? So the ancient doctors of India said with every disease, 
wind it all the way back, start with digestion. And this is what I do when I take on a new per patient. We have to fix digestion because we could talk about milk and all the best types of milk, but the protein and gluten and dairy are the two most difficult to digest. And unless your liver is highly intelligent and working normally, which I haven't seen one yet in all my 35 years of practice, um, but it's going to turn it into amavish. You're not going to feel well. So I could sit here and say, oh yeah, have good milk uh, or, or make yogurt for your good friendly bacteria. But until you can get back on milk, if you're sensitive to it, I mentioned the only probiotic I could find that had active cultures. It's listed in the book. I looked at them all under a microscope. The cultures were all dead. I could only find one company where the cultures were actually alive. When I called that company, they said that the cultures, the companies all start with live cultures, but as they process them, the cultures die because they're very delicate. And it's very hard to make a probiotic and not kill the cultures as you're processing it. So in the book, I show you the best probiotic to take. Some of them are dairy-free, uh, the, the best yogurt to make if you wanted to make lassi, or um, there's a recipe in the book. Another way you could do it is to make what's called takra, where you take um, heavy cream, turn it into yogurt overnight, churn that into butter. And when you churn that into butter, you're actually, that's true buttermilk. So I give recipe where you could sip that at lunchtime. So the point is there's several ways that you could regrow your friendly bacteria. The easy of, easiest of them all is to take a probiotic. But, um, but again, there's other ways as well. So, but you'll learn about them all in the book. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Going for the questions here. Another one from Adriana. She says, I understand moringa is very heating, yet it's listed as a treatment. I think that was on the um, Hashimoto's one for um, the liver. So could you briefly comment on that one, please? Yeah, the only way I would use moringa, I hardly use it for Hashimoto's, just so you know. Uh, we use what's called Gaduchi Satwa. That's the one we use when we want to clean these autoimmune toxins out uh, because the satwa is the stem of the Gaduchi plant. The leaves are too heating too. So that's why I said there's different ways to give these. So moringa wouldn't be my first way to clean the bone marrow, but instead we give drumstick soup. It's the pod of the moringa tree. Now that the recipe I give in the book of the drumstick soup, that is cooling. It won't heat the liver. Yeah, but you don't want to take moringa leaves. Um, you know, you could do a little or moringa tea. It's a little heating. Yeah. Right. I've got a question that someone emailed us beforehand from Dr. Katoch. Um, they were asking whether non pharmacological interventions of Ayurveda alone can provide effective thyroid care. If yes, please enumerate those interventions and their pathway of action. That's what the whole book's about. That would take me a few hours to talk about. But if you read the book, see, it's all, every patient is individual. It depends on the patient. When I take on a new patient, I could have a hundred of them with thyroid problems and they all want to know if this is something we could fix. And the, the whole idea is how far down that path of um, this, you know, like pathology have they gone? If say the worst case scenario is that the immune system has totally scarred the thyroid and it can't work, then they might need pharmaceuticals, that's for sure. But we still want to fix the reason why that happened. See what I'm saying? The, we wanna fix the immune system. So, because right now it's attacking the thyroid, but it could go attack something else and create Sjogren's over here or rheumatoid arthritis over there, see? So we have to have a holistic perspective where we're not just thinking in terms of thyroid and what do we do for the thyroid? And if we have these people, can we guarantee that their thyroid will get better? But we have these people who have gut issues, liver issues, too much fluoride, see what I'm saying? Too much intervention of pharmaceuticals in the bone marrow. So we wanna look at it like that. And with each person, you always hope that you can retrieve them before they go down that disease path too much. But, but that's what the book's about, exactly how to do that, yeah.
Okay, so we've got another one on milk. We're back to milk. Vivian has said, how much cow's milk do you recommend daily? Again, it depends on the person, what your digestion of it is like, and you have to take it in the correct way. Maybe say one cup a day. It depends on if you're a vegetarian or not. If you're a vegetarian, you might need a cup a day of that and maybe some paneer or yogurt as well, because you run the risk of getting too low in protein, B12, iron, you know, if you don't have enough animal protein in the diet. So it's hard to say exactly how much every single person needs. Because if you're having chicken, turkey, fish, um, you might need a little less milk. Maybe one cup a day would be enough for, or at least five times a week. Right. I've got a question from Prasanna. What is responsible for thyroid nodules and what would be the approach for treating it? So it's like a domino effect where you have to first see what's causing the thyroid to be weak. But when the thyroid's weak, the gallbladder doesn't empty the bile well, <clears throat> and you can't get rid of estrogen. So you wind up with a situation of high estrogen, low progesterone. And that estrogen feeds things. It makes things grow. It does other things too that, is, that aren't so good, but it can make nodules grow. So so we don't want to say, oh, well, we have this Alodra and Ashoka. I have a recipe in the book that recalibrates the ratio between estrogen and progesterone. Yeah, you might need to do that. But then we have to look at the gallbladder. Why isn't that emptying? And then we have to look at the thyroid. Why isn't that working? See, so then we work our way back to digestion. And this is what you have to do with everyone. We can't just say you know, that we have this thyroid problem. See, I'll keep coming back to that idea. And, and that we wanna stay focused on why am I getting the nodules when you have to keep working back, working back until you hit the root of the problem, see? But you have to treat every step of the way, see? Okay, um, the next one here I've got um, from Joe Weber. I'm, cause I'm skipping one, Colette. You can do that one if you want. <laughs> it says, I've read that blocked creativity can lead to thyroid issues through aggravating Vata. Have you noticed this in your patients? And Chita, thanks for an amazing session, so. Well, one thing I can tell you, having done this for 35 years plus, is that anything can cause anything. So if you blocking your creativity is creating a disturbance in Vata, then you start down that path that the ancient doctors were talking about. The, th the thyroid's very delicate. I think of the thyroid as like a little princess, you know, like, oh, this, this bothers me. Oh, you went to bed past 10. Oh, and she gets weak. Or, oh my God, you just got a flu shot. And she, you know, it's like that. So if you're constantly holding back, you know, your God-given talents and your creativity and it's affecting you, it's got to affect the thyroid. See, it's, it's affecting your whole body, but thyroid is something we could measure in the blood work. So we could say, oh, you have a thyroid problem. When the truth is, you know, you have that problem with the creativity being, you know, not allowed to come out and it's affecting the Vata, see? But you're learning, keep going back to the cause. That's why I say it's a little different in each person, you know? And many people, I know when I was in chiropractic college, all of us developed thyroid problems because it was so stressful. We had clinic at night, classes all day, exams every other day. The thyroid can handle stress. So any kind of stress, it's just going to kill over. But then once we supported it and the stress was over, the thyroid perked back up. Not one of us ended up taking thyroid hormones, see? So that's like the last resort when you've tried everything and it's just not enough because the thyroid, you know, is too depleted now, which I don't see that often. Uh, then you could always use the medicine. But yeah, anything could cause it. Right, another question is, is 10 years too long to come off thyroid hormones? Ten Again, years. one thing I've seen with people, you never know. I've had people be on it 15 years and they just go right off it, they're great. And I've had people be on it two years and they're having a hard time because they're having a hard time controlling the, the bedtime and the amount of sunshine and the vitamin D levels. And see what I'm saying? It, it depends on how much you can help out the thyroid in all those other ways. If you can't, if you're not able to do that, then it might be more difficult to get off the, um, the, the drug. 
And it, it, it also depends on how much damage the thyroid took on from going on the medicine because it can disintegrate the thyroid. Depends how sensitive you are to that medicine and what it might have done to your thyroid. So you don't know till you try it. Okay, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna put two herb ones together because we've got one here that says, what herbs do you use for a cold cleanse? That's from Fatima. And then we've got another one saying, what is the best way to use ashwagandha to avoid overheating? And that's from Susan. Are you okay if I put those together? So what was it? What do I use? Herbs for the what? First ones, what herbs do you use for a cold cleanse? That's from Fatima. That's in the book, yeah. The, um, again, I guess it was. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then how do you use ashwagandha to avoid overheating? Well, we give it either transdermally or in the glyceride drops. Most of the time I give it transdermally where we rub it on the skin and then it goes right in, supports the thyroid. It's not going through the liver when you rub it on the skin. But as far as the cleanses go, I give all types of foods in the book that cleanse. Uh, and there's all different things you wanna to cleanse too. You can cleanse the liver, you could cleanse the bone marrow, you could cleanse the mitochondria. So the book talks about all the different things it is you wanna cleanse, but you have to always do it in a way that keeps the liver cool, so. Okay, it's good. We're getting lots of questions. So, I mean, Colette and I are trying to go through them here. We've got, are you okay? We've got about 26 new ones to come. That's okay, we still have time. Okay, so um, the next one um, says, how do you optimize or rebalance the gallbladder? So we haven't had one on the gallbladder for a while, so I'll just move on to that one and then over okay. to you, Colette. Well, that's why I have a whole chapter on the gallbladder. Um, and it's all easy to understand. Same thing, you have to see in each person specifically which herbs um, that they can tolerate that promotes the flow of bile out of the gallbladder. So in the book, I talk about trifolate is one way, but not everybody does well on that. So then we could try harataki. Um, and then there's, there's other ways. I give tea recipes, you'll see in there, We're using Indian sarsaparilla, fenugreek seeds, which help you digest the fats better, sometimes neem. So you have to kind of work it and see what's the best combination for that patient or for yourself. There's foods, the best food of all for promoting bile flow is red beets, B-E-E-T-S, beetroot, uh, cooked, not raw, don't use them, but you're cooking them. But beets are good, artichokes are good, but they're labor intensive. Most people don't eat those as much, but it's easy enough to have cooked beets to get that bile moving. Next question, um, if someone is already on synthetic hormones, how do you transition them off? By doing exactly what I was just saying. First, think of, try, try to get out of the habit that you have this thyroid problem. Instead, try to think, I wonder why I have a thyroid problem. See the difference? Not like, I have a thyroid problem, I'm taking synthetic hormones, how do I get off them? To, I wonder why my thyroid's so weak. Am I going to bed too late? Was I drinking tap water that maybe had fluoride in it? Do I ever get out in the sun and make enough vitamin D? Uh, Cause that also prevents, like, am I rushing through the day? Am I not eating enough? See what I'm saying? Once you identify those factors, strengthen the thyroid. See, that, that's what the, the idea is, to, to break the habit of thinking, oh, low thyroid hormone, synthroid. Or if, an, if you're an Ayurvedic practitioner saying, oh, low thyroid hormone, ashwagandha and shilajit. It's true, they can support it, but until you figure out, that's why the ancient doctors said before any prescriptions written, meaning of herbs, you have to see what's causing it. You have to find that hey to, they called it. So we always come back to that. And it's true with any disease. You know, you could say, um, you know, I have say rheumatoid arthritis. That's just the name, but, but why? Why do you have the rheumatoid arthritis? Or, or why do you have the cancer? Or why do you, see, you have to address that. A lot of people tell me, oh yeah, I just got diagnosed with this, that, or the other. And I say, well, did the doctor tell you why you have it? And they say, no, they never say why. They just jump right into, they skip all the steps and jump, jump right into 
how to suppress that symptom. Oh, I have diabetes, my blood sugar is high. Why? See, it's usually coming from the liver. The liver can't do it anymore. It's, it's too upset with all these other chemicals in it. So the blood sugar goes out of control. So what do they do? They give metformin, which damages the liver, but your blood work looks good with the blood sugar. See, so my teacher from India, he called this Kali Yuga medicine. Do you know the word Kali Yuga? I don't know if most of you know, <laughs> but there's different periods of time. Each lasts so many thousands and thousands of years that goes from the most supreme and wonderful, which is called Sat Yuga, where like everybody's living in tune with laws of nature and the body could probably live 800 years because you're not breaking any rules. The air is good, the, the, the food is good, you know, everyone automatically does that. Then there's another yuga or time period that down where some of that knowledge is lost, uh, maybe a little bit. So now the body could only live to about maybe 600 years, you know. And then there's another time down from that where even more knowledge is lost. But then there's this deep, dark, terrible time period called Kali Yuga, where not only is the knowledge lost, the opposite is true. And in Kali Yuga, they say you could go to a doctor and they would harm you. They would give your children, like they are here in the States, 73 shots with aluminum that damage the brain and wonder why where I live, one in 37 boys has autism. Or they would put young girls on birth control pills because their menstrual cycle is skipping, not realizing it's the thyroid. And it looks like they have a nice period. And so they stay on them for years and then they get breast cancer. Or your cholesterol's high because your gallbladder's not working. So you give statin drugs that damage the liver, but it looks real good on blood work. So this is Kali Yuga thinking. So my teacher always called it Kali Yuga medicine. And in fact, Ayurveda was cognized by the ancient rishis of India in Kali Yuga because they knew there would be a lot of suffering because of it. We can all say, you know, medicine has saved our lives, but it has also harmed us. I think we all have some story we could tell. I have a few. My patients tell me every day their stories. So it's good on the one hand, but then it can hurt you. So if you can learn how to navigate your way through modern medicine and really understand that we have to get to the root of the problem, uh, we have to break that habit of just thinking, oh, I have rheumatoid arthritis. Oh, I have cancer into thinking, why do I have rheumatoid arthritis? What do I need to do to make that go away? See, like right now I have a lot of people, they have like tingling in their body. All the nerves are burning and that tingling, it feels like electric shocks. They went and got MRIs. I see this all the time. The MRI says it's good, there's no MS. So they told them you're good. There's nothing we need to do. And they went home they said, but I'm up all night with all this electric shocks. something must be wrong. So when we feel their pulse, we can see that the nerve tissue is suffering. The amavisha and the garvisha, they're so hot, it's burning the myelin sheath, not enough to where they could find it. So they're letting them go, saying nothing's wrong with you. And if you let that go, 10 years from now, they'll have MS or some other demyelinating disease. So that right there is what's wrong with modern medicine. And that's why I feel compelled. This is my first book on the thyroid, but I'm in the process now of writing on all the other diseases. Because from what I can see, the same way that the thyroid isn't being treated correctly, they're missing the whole point of it. They're missing the whole point on so many other diseases like high cholesterol, diabetes, cancer. See? So, so that's what I hope to do in my upcoming books. Well, it's um, absolutely fantastic to hear. And, you know, you really do put everything across so easily. And we're getting lots of thank yous and it's very informative. So just so that, you know, everyone really appreciates what you're doing there. And I think what you were just talking about when you were saying how you just go and get a label leads us into the next question from Michael. And um, he says, could, could you discuss hyperthyroid and how people can exhibit symptoms and switch between hypo and hyper state. So um, I'll put that one back over to you. Well, same thing. You have to see what's causing it. You don't get a hyperthyroid for nothing. It means it's, it's too excitable. And if it gets hyper for too long, eventually it might get tired and then be underactive. In, in either case, what's bothering the thyroid? Again, just from experience, what I could see is usually with a hyperthyroid, it's usually a heavy metal. It's either mercury 
there's a lot of mercury in the air pollution from the coal mines um, or from the fish, they have mercury. Some people eat a lot of fish. Uh, or it could be from if you had mercury silver amalgams growing up, they don't do it as much anymore. Uh, or, but what I see the most here in the States, I don't know if you guys get them, but we get flu shots every year here. Like most of the population gets those. Do you get those there too? They try to make us, but I think probably a lot of the people that are on this call will be rejecting the, uh, the appointments for them. So, yeah. Yeah. So what I see when people have had 20, 30, 40 flu shots, see the thyroid is the only gland who takes in iodine. So whatever iodine comes in, the thyroid gets it and it makes its hormones out of it. If mercury comes in, the thyroid prefers the mercury over the iodine because mercury looks a lot like iodine and it goes and, and it goes to the thyroid and it's you could feel it in the person's pulse. There's a certain feel what a heavy metal feels like. It's like dead and heavy and hard. And you could feel it um, in Udan Vada, which is the thyroid you know, area. You could feel that very hard. Normally the pulse is real nice and beautiful, but when you feel that you're like, oh my God. And um, they're, they're loaded, the thyroid's just sucking up that mercury. So the thyroid, like I say, because it's the only gland who affects every cell in the body, other glands don't do that. They have a certain few things they affect. Anything that's, you know, that's off in the body could affect the thyroid. But usually with hyper, we see like a, some kind of nasty, either pharmaceutical, for instance, I had a patient who got hyperthyroid. He had gone for a CAT scan where I give them the iodine to take. The amount of iodine in there is like 200 times more than what you would get in the diet. And it totally overwhelms the thyroid. Now, some people can handle it, but in his case, he developed hyperthyroid symptoms after that. So I had to use the Gaducci and, you know, to pull it out and flush it out and see what I'm saying. So it's usually some kind of a nasty chemical uh, and sometimes it's hidden. You wouldn't know it. Like in the soil, um, here where I get my, I go to a local farmer's market to get my produce because they're just picking the produce and it's very nice. Here, I've been doing that for 30 years. I found out last year their soil has arsenic in it. So these are hidden things that we just don't know are there or in the air pollution or certain foods we might've eaten growing up. So sometimes it's hard to find the cause, but it's usually some kind of a nasty chemical like that, like arsenic, mercury, lead, uh, pesticides, air pollution. If you work in a chemical factory, a lot of the chemists I see, their thyroid goes off from all the chemicals they're breathing in every day. So it's hard to say exactly what it is. But then once you identify that, get rid of those chemicals and then calm down the thyroid and then let it just relax and, and go back down. Right, we've got a question um, from Moira Forsyth. She's asking, what if a person has had their thyroid gland removed? Well, then you have to take the hormone, but why did she have the thyroid gland removed? See what I'm saying? Some people tell me, well, I had cancer when I was 12, you know, and I think that's not normal. Something had to happen. So we have to look back and see what happened, you know. So because we have to make sure that they're not continuing to do those things that hurt the thyroid. Okay, so it hurt it to the point where you had to remove it. Now you have to take the hormones, but make sure they're not doing that because it could hurt something else. See what I'm saying? We've got one here from Dr. Reiser she says, thank you for an interesting talk. Did you analyze microbiome before and after to make sure friendly bacteria is selectively promoted? It might not just be that the friendly bacteria, but rather their interaction and metabolic activity that is the key. Yeah, there's all kinds of tests now. And um, in chiropractic college, I learned ways of analyzing it uh, using a system called applied kinesiology. So there's all different ways that you can test that nowadays stool samples and all that. Good. Um, we've got a question from Tina. What are your thoughts on aloe vera for cooling and cleansing the liver? You can do it. You have to watch. There's different grades to it. And some of them could give you diarrhea. 
but yeah, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my test showed raised TSH 7.17, normal thyroxine and subclinical hypothyroidism. I'm taking kelp tablets. Is that okay? And that's from Mary. Mary, I think you probably need to um, be booking a consultation with Marianne. You can see, you might be a lucky one that that was the only reason it, I would say it's rare that, that the kelp would answer all your, you know, or solve all your problems. If it does and your TSH goes down to normal, good. But, but still, I would make sure you're not making any other mistakes. Because again, one thing my teacher from India taught me was whatever is bothering that patient, the underlying causes are numerous. It's not one. So to, you know, usually when they tell you your thyroid's weak, everybody thinks of iodine. So here we're saying, don't take iodine, it's synthetic, it tortures the thyroid and the liver, but take kelp. I talk about that in the book. It's more natural, has the prana, it grows from the earth. But still, we can't assume that that's the only reason that it's weak, see? Because here in the West, we're led to believe that a lot of our symptoms come from a deficiency of some vitamin. And if we could just take that vitamin, everything will get better. See, and I haven't seen where it works that way. Okay, right. um, I um, just wanted to ask a question. Thomas, go for it. I was just texting you. I was just saying, um, uh, from your perspective, Marianne, what, according to your opinion, is the most common um, condition or symptoms that are linked with the with men that have thyroid imbalances so if you look at the thyroid from a male perspective what are from your uh, opinion here the, the the most commonly um linked symptoms and conditions please usually they're working too hard uh, they're sitting in front of a computer for too long they're never getting outside in the sun and it's just they're pushing too much stress and it, it gets weak yeah Mm -hmm. they're, they're usually a little less complicated than the women because women have all these other issues with estrogen, progesterone. They're, they're a little more delicate, whereas the men, it, it always seems like it's because they're overworking and just pushing too hard. And and where what would you say is a second as thyroid imbalance as a secondary um, condition in male? So where you say okay, thyroid is secondary to any of these main conditions in the male well it's it's we can't just say thyroid i would say that the whole endocrine system gets mm. weakened from too much stress so we could blame it maybe on the adrenals if the adrenal glands are hyper you know and they're pushing all day making cortisol cortisol disables the thyroid gland yeah. so so that the real thing is not enough rest a lot of these problems with the endocrine system come from not enough rest going to bed too late. In the book, I talk about they shined lights on birds um, and they, they made them stay up at night. And what it affected was their endocrine system. They'd stopped ovulating, see? Mm -hmm. So we see a lot of that where we're just staying up too late. Because we have artificial lighting, we could do it, but it's yeah. not good for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, we've got a question from Lucy Fairclough. Is there any correlation between increase in thyroid blood work results and the current health situation in the world, i.e. COVID? Could the disease create an autoimmune response which further degrades the thyroid function? If you wanna take a real broad perspective on this, we can say thyroid is responsible for COVID or some of these other things, but the ancient textbooks of India said that if we, the whole world gets too out of balance. See how there's too much carbon and emissions and um, just like on a person when there's too much toxins going through the liver, it overheats. So the whole world right now is so polluted with air pollution. When the whole world gets out of balance, the bugs also can get out of balance too. So that's one perspective on it. We, we also don't know if that in China they were it was a, um, a university, the Wuhan University. They were always making viruses and you know, that's what they do. So maybe one escaped. So it could just be something like that. 
they don't know for sure how it all started, but um, it's, it's hard to say exactly where COVID came from. If it's the, from the whole earth being out of balance and our immune systems are so weakened from all the pharmaceuticals that we're not handling the virus, or if it was just some weird mutation type viruses that they were exper experimenting with and, it, and the person who's experimenting with it got it and then it started spreading, so. Okay, questions keep coming. <laughs> Dr. Ricef again, where do you send samples for microbiome analysis? Um, that's part one. I think it's gonna be different in the States than here, Dr. Ricef. So maybe you need to um, ask Dr. Vijay about that because he would know that. But I know there are the great Smokies lab, so that's one. And do mm -hmm. you recommend any specific panchakarma treatments for hypothyroidism? You again, no, nothing, nothing is general. Like if you went to a Panchakarma clinic, they want to see your own unique pulse to see why the thyroid's hyper, and then they would know what to do. Um, for myself with the gut microbiome, I, I learned this technique in chiropractic college called applied kinesiology, where we can do muscle testing. And I learned how to test it that way. And um, so I don't really need to use those labs. I used to use Great Smokies when I first opened in the early 80s. I don't anymore because I found out that once we started using this one really good company, I did everyone's gut got better and their food allergies went away. And especially when we learned how to cool the heat in the liver, it, it's not just coming from the gut microbiome, but also from the liver because they're the seat of digestion. The friendly bacteria have to break the food down and the liver has to process it correctly. So if you just give a good probiotic, you sometimes don't have to get involved with the exact strains and which one the person has to take. But if you give a good probiotic and you cool that heat in the liver, everything settles down really. Um, I've got a question from Michael. If thyroglobulins are very high, say 120, which is well above the range, and there is no indication of thyroid cancer based on other markers. What conditions may have caused levels to rise this high, and are there herbs that help lower this? We have to, again, break that habit. It's very hard to do, even though I lecture on it, and I tell the patients it's a hard habit to break. I always come back to that. There's no set herbs to just lower this. So you have to see in that person what's causing it. It's different in each person. That's why for me, it was a little hard to write a book on this because it would be easier if I said, oh yeah, for hyperthyroid and this number, we do that. And if the TSH is here, we do this. It's not like that. That's how modern medicine works, but we have to scrap that whole idea and think about in our case, what might I be doing wrong that's creating this high thyroglobulin? See what I'm saying? So I couldn't tell that person unless I did a thorough case history and then we could pinpoint some things. And then if the liver's hot, we have to go this way. If it's not, we could go this way. You see, if the gut's off, we have to go that way. So we're always figuring out in each person exactly what we have to do. So it's hard to answer questions like that. Okay, I think we're um, probably getting down to the end of your uh, ability to speak soon, Marianne. Are you okay for a couple of more questions or? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Okay, I mean, we're having some privately to, saying, uh, could you comment on COVID? And I think I need to say, um, this probably isn't the best place to do that. People have had their first jabs and they're worried. And we will put in the chat box, Carolina, if you could, if you would like to um, book an appointment with Marianne, she she does do that via Skype, so she can she can look at that and you can maybe talk to her privately. So just I'm just going to go past that one. I mean, I could comment on one thing in that the whole Ayurvedic community isn't saying one way or the other. You mean whether to get the shot or not? Or yeah, and this person's had their shot and they're yeah, that's they're, fine. It's up to, see, no one knows what these, you could ask any doctor, any researcher, what will these vaccines do? We don't know. One thing we know is we probably need them to get out of this pandemic. 
But what are they going to do? No one can tell you because it's a new technology. We don't know. So I don't know. I asked my family doctor, who's a regular doctor, what, what are the side effects? She said she doesn't know. So it's up to each person if they feel they need to get this because COVID could kill you too, you know? So if you're more afraid of COVID and dying from that, then get the shot. If you want to wait a little bit and see how other people are doing, you can do it. So we have a whole, you know, different segments of society here that are doing different things. Some are waiting, some definitely don't want it. Some are, most of our patients, they're on the list. They can't wait to get it because they're tired of the pandemic. So I'm staying out of that picture because I don't know myself. I, I only comment on things that I know. Like I know the flu shot because I've been dealing with the side effects of that for 30 some years. And I know the mercury, what it's done. But this, I don't, I don't know what it's going to do yet. Maybe a few years from now, I'll know. But we have to sit back and see now what it's going to do. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I've got lots of comments on here. I have to tell you, they're halfway through your book. They're reading your book. They're really enjoying your book. So lots of people oh, thank you. already love your book and they've got it and they're out there and they're really happy. So another one saying thank you, an absolutely fascinating talk. And they've got your book. So... You know, you are very much appreciated um, and oh, it's thank you. very well known. So, and lots of people say, I'm looking forward to reading your book now. Mm -hmm. um, I've got another one here. What would be your approach to gallbladder polyps? Same thing. What was bothering your gallbladder? What kind of fats were you eating growing up? What kind of diet? So in there, I'll talk about the bad fats, the good fats. Um, but once you have them, they might be okay. As long as they don't interfere with the flow of bile, out of the gallbladder, but you have to think of what might have caused them and stop doing that. Okay. I think we'll just go for one more then. Um, uh, I, my phone keeps going. Someone with very inflamed liver and the blood works over time is showing anti-nuclear ABS markers are very high. Over time, the liver inflammation has gone down, but an ABS is constantly high. What could be causing this? That's a good one to end on, isn't it? And again, we're getting involved with these names, the fancy names, the numbers. Yeah. But the immune system's attacking the liver. So we have to see why. So I'd have to do a case history. See what you, you, know, what you were eating your whole life. Uh, see what kind of chemicals, pharmaceuticals. You know, I, I can't... Actually, the, you know, the good news with the liver is it's not that hard to fix because it's very easy to regenerate. So if you can see what's causing it, stop doing that. Then give the herbs to clean the liver, but keep it cool. The herbs to regenerate the liver, which I have a real interesting story in the book of this one. It's called Mankand. This guy, um, for those of you that read the book, saw the story. He was dying of liver failure and he was um, in a coma and he was on a liver transplant list. So they asked my teacher, is there an herb that could save him? And he said, well, there is, but uh, we can never find it. It's called Mankand. So his family searched all over India. They found a little bit of it and they got, got it to him. And he came out of the coma. He, um, he even got off the transplant list. In fact, my teacher and I were teaching a course on the liver. This was about 10 years ago. And I, he flew from India to our course and I got to feel his pulse. So I asked my teacher if I could have that herb, so I have it now. So I talk about that herb in the book. It's a really interesting herb. But again, we don't want to say, oh, take these herbs for the liver if you have your liver disease. First, we have to see what's causing it. Otherwise, let's say uh, you're drinking wine every night and you like the wine, but your liver hates it. And let's say you're eating margarine or you know, some vegetable oil like canola oil or sunflower oil, and it's poisoning your liver. And if you keep, or you're on some statin drug like Crestor and it's damaging the liver or metformin, whatever herbs you take to try to fix the liver, you're not gonna get far until you identify these underlying influences on the liver. You have to stop that and then you take the herbs, see? So that's why a big part of what I do with the new patients, I have to play detective. And I have to go through the pharmaceuticals they've taken. What are they on now? Have you taken a lot of vitamins because they damage the liver? Have you, you know, what's the diet been like your whole life? Not lately, but your whole life, see? So, and, and then you could see what's affecting the immune system to attack the liver like that. 
Well, I mean, it's been absolutely fascinating, and I'm sure I speak for everybody here before I hand over to Thomas, that I think we're going to need you back again, because we need to do this one, Mark Two. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much, because it's been great, and um, we really need to everybody to get your book, and then maybe we'll have a more in-depth one next time, because you can always see by the amount of questions that you get and the interest that this is like you say, so many people now with thyroid issues and so many Ayurvedic practitioners out there that are treating thyroid like yourself mm -hmm. on a regular basis. So we'd love to have you back again. You've been fantastic. So as the president of the APA, I'd like to say thank you very, very much because it's really, really been so important and i think your approach as well every time you know you're just you're not naming you're just saying go back to the beginning go back to basics yeah. have a look at the the whole picture which yeah. is great so um we're, we're really looking forward to your new book as well now now you've given us a teaser about your new yeah. book so <laughs> it'll be a long time before it's out i'm in the early stages of writing it everything's a lengthy process <laughs> So, Thomas, I'm going to hand back over to you, but thank you very, very much, Marianne. Oh, thanks for having me. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Sue. And again, even from my perspective, just a massive um, congratulations for this achievement. And as a professional, as some of our Ayurvedic professionals on the call here, we know how tricky it can be to convince patients that it is not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's all very individual and I guess uh, irrespective of um, what people will take away from this call today, definitely what they will take away is you cannot just take a single herb, take a one-way approach and, experience and expect for things to be fixed. So again, a massive thank you. And like Sue said, we definitely would love to have you back. So before we close off, I just like to say to those that are maybe new to the Ayurvedic Professionals Association, we have a regular um, APA Ayurvedic journal that goes out every couple of months. So please go to the website and register so you will be on the mailing list for our journal. And also on the website, you will find detailed information about practitioners in your area, especially within the UK. And also, please, if you have any personal questions, Marianne um, has given us the details and Carolina has put the details throughout the chat um, in the chat box where you can book your personal consultation with Marianne. And what else is there to say? Um, yeah, so, and of course, if you would like to join as a member, there are application forms and you don't need to just um, join as a member if you are an Ayurvedic professional or health professional in general. We have also got supporters uh, of the Ayurvedic community. So anybody from the um, community outside can actually also join and support the association so that we are able to provide more and more of those excellent speakers like Marianne on very interesting topics. Now, what we will do is before we close off, um, Carolina is putting on a questionnaire, just a very quick feedback for those. And we would kindly ask you to just fill in these questions. And I'm giving you just an overview of the next three upcoming seminars. There is Dr. Robert Verkirk on Thursday, the 15th of April. And the topic is health as a habit that will be co-hosted by Dr. Vijay Moti. And then we have Anne McIntyre looking at local herbs from an Ayurvedic perspective. It's a very practical interactive um, workshop, which will be on Wednesday, the 21st of April. And Herbal Alliance promoting all who use herbs in their practice with Sebastian Paul. It's on Wednesday, the 12th of May. And for this seminar in particular, I would like to mention, it is not just for professionals, but you will get also a very good um, uh, idea of how to use certain herbs in general, even as a lay person. So again, keeping all this in mind, we would like to thank everybody for joining and for the amazing 
questions and participation at the end of the webinar, which kept the whole thing really alive. And between Colette and Sue, it was a great balance to share the questions. And again, a massive heartfelt thank you, Marianne, for joining us. And we all wish you safe weekend, safe journey and 